Back in the days of tube socks and cassette tapes, the adventures written for Dungeons & Dragons were called modules. Also, telephones were attached to the wall by cords, and the internet was something that happened to fish when they got caught in nets. Okay, that joke is a bit of a reach, I will admit. Anyway, modules tended to be shorter, in the realm of 32 to 64 pages. Fast forward to the modern day, and bigger books are much more profitable. Now they need to be 224 pages or more, and priced accordingly to justify the printing and development costs. And thus, hefty tomes like Curse of Strahd and Vecna Eve of Ruin are born. But there's still a lot of desire for modules. People are selling shorter stuff on the DMs Guild because we don't always want to launch on a two-year campaign every time. Strahd is great, but that's a commitment, bruh. So compact modules still have a place in the world, but how does WotC balance that with the need to write longer books to justify the production costs? Collections. Tales from the Yawning Portal, Ghosts of Salt Marsh, and Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, to name a few. These collections serve a purpose to give you plenty of stuff to steal if you want to run a homebrew game, but don't want to do 100% of the work yourself. I would contend that it's much easier to steal a chapter from Candlekeep Mysteries than it is to steal a chapter from Tomb of Annihilation. I've mined quite a lot from Keys from the Golden Vault by taking the maps and room descriptions and monsters and using my own NPCs and plot hooks. And now we come to Quests from the Infinite Staircase. In another nostalgia grab, those wizards on the coast are remastering half a dozen old adventures for 5e, and today we're going to dig into them so you can decide if this new book is worth spending your hard-earned cash. This is not a sponsored video and no one is paying me or giving me free stuff to say the things I'm saying. Now let's dig into it. According to the book, each of these six adventures should take three to four sessions around 12 to 16 hours each. And those adventures are The Lost City for first to third level, When a Star Falls for fourth to fifth, Beyond the Crystal Cave for sixth level, Pharaoh for seventh to eighth level, the Lost Caverns of This Word for 9th to 10th, and Expedition to the Barrier Peaks for 11th to 13th. Let me talk about the overall plot hook, then we'll do a brief review of each individual adventure. Spoilers from here on out. The adventures are themed around an infinite staircase dimension based on the Monty Cook adventure Tales from the Infinite Staircase for 2E. Like most media these days, it's associated with the multiverse, with a staircase that goes on forever, and a bunch of doors along it that lead to various places. The whole area is plagued by something called the Iron Shadow, which is a quote, creeping malady that feels very much like the gloom in Tears of the Kingdom. Aside from that, the only noteworthy thing in the staircase is the NPC of Nafas, who you can use as the main quest giver and patron of the party if you want to tie all of those separate adventures into a campaign. He has a lair called the Censor of Dreams, and he basically doesn't do a whole lot. He acts as a quest giver each time by saying, Oh, hey guys, I just heard someone make a wish. Why don't you go through that door over there and check it out? Then you do the quest, and the book makes returning simple by saying, after each adventure, have the characters find a door back to the infinite staircase. Otherwise, it suggests having Nafas hand out magic items to the PCs after they complete a certain number of quests. And honestly, this feels like a big missed opportunity. Why not integrate him into the quests a little more by making him tied to specific NPCs? He doesn't really do anything except point the PCs where to go next, so there's very little reason to care about him. Real quick, since I have you, could I get a like and subscribe below? It only takes a second and it helps us both out. Make sure to click all next to notifications, and also click the join button to get exclusive perks when you join my channel. Our first adventure is the Lost City for low-level PCs. There's a multi-level dungeon city in the desert buried underneath a ziggurat. All I can make out is one word of Delilah's craptastic scribble. Something called a zipper uh, Okay, yeah, actually, I think it's a ziggurat. Oh, thank God. Because what I was picturing was like, whoa. Inside are three warring factions that share a common enemy of a fourth faction, and the PCs can ally with whoever they want, or can go full murder hobo and plow through all of them. The plot hook here is that while the adventurers are on the infinite staircase, Nafas tells them the people of this sunken city need help and sends them through that door. 
This is the same general plot framing device for all of these adventures. Fortunately, each adventure does offer alternate hooks if you think Nafas is boring and half-baked, which he is. Also, each offers options for alternate campaign settings if you want to play in Greyhawk or Eberron or Forgotten Realms, etc. So this adventure is not bad. The factions are differentiated enough to make it interesting, and they give a little nod to furry, positive lifestyles, so that's the thing. The dungeon reminds me a lot of the Sunless Citadel, one of my favorite shorter modules. This is a buried five level dungeon, which is good for newer DMs who want to keep their party from wandering off too much. The maps and the room descriptions are decent, and I might steal some of those and drop in my own hooks and NPCs for my campaign world. Shades of Hidden Shrine of Tomoakon here. Overall, this adventure is fine. Next up is the 4 to 6 level adventure When a Star Falls, which sounds like a gritty competition reality show, but it's actually about a star that is prophesied to fall and land in a set of mountains. The PCs can learn about this and discover other groups are also hunting for the location of the fallen star, then the chase is on. This module is more open world than many railroady Watsi adventures in that the PCs can explore the mountains however they want, interacting with various NPCs along the way to deal with this fallen star MacGuffin. It starts with the PCs finding some corpses and then fighting a thing called a memory web. When that's defeated, they unlock the memories of the dead and learn all about the falling star. Now the PCs set off to unravel this mystery and will bump into the other parties interested in finding it, including an assassin who is tailing them. There's also an interesting encounter with a druid who will tell the party where the star fell if they play their cards right. Overall, this adventure is good and has a nice range of activities, and I do like the sandbox nature of it. One thing I don't like here is the maps. They feel too flat. I wish they would use one map artist for the whole book to give it a more consistent feel. Anyway, no one asked me, but the Mike Schley maps are all great. For our sixth level module, Beyond the Crystal Cave goes full theater kid with a Shakespearean inspired adventure. It asks the question, what if Romeo and Juliet just decided to bounce instead of unaliving themselves and then the families called off the feud and wanted the lovers to come back because, like, it's all good now. This adventure goes from a place named the Cave of Echoes into a Feywild domain and leans into a Wild Beyond the Witchlight style where it presents non-violent options for most encounters. And it's interesting that the 1983 adventure this is based on also leaned into non-violence. Funny how we used to think of old school D&D as being all hack and slash, but that was not always the case. The PCs begin in the city of Saibar. There is a D8 list of rumors the PCs can learn, and half of these rumors are false. I would not waste the player's time by exposing them to false rumors. I mean, what's the benefit of doing that? I don't see it. Anyway, the characters are asked by the governor to go through the Cave of Echoes and into the Feywild to find the two fleeing lovers. The cave is a linear dungeon and leads to a fey crossing into a place called the Eternal Garden. The garden is full of the usual whimsical fey stuff like a pair of awakened badgers fretting over a visit from their in-laws. You know, weird crap. The PCs can hear limericks from leprechauns describing various places to go visit in the garden. Ultimately, the party finds the two lovers at a place called the Palace of the Spires, but then they say they don't want to leave. They've been perma-charmed by drinking from a fountain in the garden, and it takes a wish spell to break the charm. You can earn a wish spell in a room inside the palace, but I don't know why you'd want to waste it on the lovers, since they seem perfectly fine just staying put. Ultimately, I feel like the ending here is unsatisfying. You're sent to rescue these people, they don't want to go, so you're you're like, okay, cool, I guess we'll just be leaving now, then? Next up is Pharaoh for 7th to 8th level, and I don't like this one at all. We leave behind the whimsical face stuff and go full murder tomb gauntlet in this first edition remake that is heavily Egyptian flavored. Anyway, this one has a convoluted backstory that basically boils down to some jerk pharaoh needs adventurers to brave the traps and trials in his lavish tomb so he can move on to the afterlife. He approaches the party in the desert and tells them all this, then leads them to the pyramid. That's basically it for story elements. There are a few historians from an academic faction around the tomb who can provide exposition, but it's mostly a dungeon delve from this point on, and it is a dense and confusing dungeon delve. 
For example, the only way to get to the second level is through an offering bowl in a room on the first level. Put a creature or object in it and it's teleported. And the book says, To an onlooker, the object or creature appears to be consumed by the flame, vanishing in an instant. So I can see this easily being missed. The text for the second floor calls it a, quote, vast, confounding maze designed to defeat clever intruders who bypass the false tomb by way of the offering bowl. That doesn't sound like fun, does it? A vast, confounding maze? The three upper floors are better, but it's still quite dense and old school, not in a good way. The PCs have to find two magic items to be able to leave, and then that's basically it. This one is definitely a no for me, dog. For ninth level, we have the one with the tricky title, The Lost Caverns of So... The Lost Caverns of So... The Lost Caverns of This Thing. This adventure ditches the complex backstory of the previous one in favor of a straightforward dungeon crawl. It was originally written by Mr. Gary Gygax himself almost 50 years ago. The titular caverns were home to Egwilv, aka Tasha of the Cauldron fame, but she pieced out of there at some point. And now you have a bunch of different nation factions warring over who gets to claim the dungeon's secrets and treasures for their own. The party is hired by the agent of a noble to recover a specific item from inside the caverns before their rivals can plunder it. Then we get a hex crawl to find the entrance where the PCs might stumble into border guards from one of those rival factions. There's some nice monster variety and potential roleplay encounters in this exploration section. And once inside the caverns, there are two massive non-linear cave levels chock full of monsters and weird subterranean creatures. This section is pretty good, honestly. And finally, when the PCs reach Tasha's abandoned sanctum, her vampire daughter is there to act as the boss monster. Overall, this is a well-made adventure. Finally, we get to Expedition to the Barrier Peaks for 11th to 13th level. This was another written by Gygax and is famous for being the first module to bend the genre. Gygax created this medieval fantasy world full of knights and dragons, castles and dungeons, and then he said, hey, you know what? We should have laser rifles and alien spaceships too. And why the hell not? It's not as if mind flares and flumps don't already twist the rules of logic. D&D is at its best when it's weird, wild, and full of the unexpected. And what's more unexpected than a barbarian from the hills wielding a pew-pew phaser pistol? I'm here for it. And the original art definitely gave me nightmares as a kid looking at this sarlacc pit monster thing. Yuck. The premise here is that aliens crashed their spaceship in the mountain range known as the Barrier Peaks long ago. Now, Nafas the genie hears someone crying out, trapped within the spaceship, and sends the party to rescue the owner of that voice. Then the PCs go explore, dive into some alien-esque close quarters horror stuff, and that's about it. Simple and clear cut. There's an evil supercomputer, a frog hemoth, and spaceship dungeon delving, plus laser pistols and antimatter rifles fueled by energy cells, and a D100 table of weird alien trinkets like fizzy drinks and iPods and jumpsuits. And I love it. This stuff is all great. Here's a mind flare in a spacesuit, and how cool is that? The maps for the levels and interaction with the evil AI supercomputer are fantastic, highly recommended just for the maps alone. At the back of the adventure, we get a bestiary and a smattering of magic items. The Staff of Ruling allows you to send out lightning grenades, which is pretty dope, and the technology items are all good, like the anti-gravity belt or the paralysis pistol. In the creatures chapter, the Frog Hemoth uses the new style of no legendary actions, but it can take three reactions per round, but only one per turn. The memory web creature has both actions and bonus actions, which is also a more recent design style. And now, what are my overall thoughts? Is quests from the infinite staircase worth your money? Mm, not really. It's okay. I like Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, Lost Caverns of This Place, and When a Star Falls. The other three adventures, I could take or leave. And since you can find all of these in their original forms out there on the internet basically for free, I can't recommend spending your cash on this adventure. The art is great, and most of the maps are good, and there are some interesting ideas sprinkled here and there, but it's generally a disappointment. I wish they had made it more cohesive with a better through-line story like they did with the Ghosts of Saltmarsh collection. Oh well, missed opportunities. And so, that's all I have to say. Until next time, I'm GM Jim. Now go run weird stuff, because weird is where it's at.